I want to be talking tonight about, well, the question of whether climate science is really settled or unsettled, and in particular about the problem of climate change. My point here is not to argue in favor of the seriousness seriousness of the, uh, the, of the issue of climate change, nor is it to argue against that. It's really to say that it's an immensely complicated problem. So if I had a subtitle to my talk tonight, it would be a plea for epistemic humility. I'm looking for ways of showing you that this is a complicated and difficult to settle issue, especially with the data we have now. But let me start by saying that most people at least who talk about this publicly, do not talk about it this way. In particular, um, the fourth national climate assessment done in 2017 said that Earth's climate is changing at a pace and in a pattern not explainable by natural influences. The last IPCC report, that's the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, said that human influence on the climate system is clear and recent anthropogenic emissions of greenhouse gases are the highest in history. Recent climate changes have had widespread impacts on human and natural systems. Barack Obama in 2014 said the debate is settled. Climate change is a fact. And President Joe Biden just a couple of weeks ago said it's a whole of government approach to put climate change at the center of our domestic national security and foreign policy. Representative Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, always good for a remarkable quotation, says we're out of time and excuses. Our country is in crisis and to address it, we will have to mobilize our social and economic resources on a massive scale. Bernie Sanders has said that climate change is a national emergency and has introduced legislation to declare it a national emergency, which would give the federal government and in particular the president a large set of plenary powers to deal with it. Well, it isn't just political figures who have taken this stance. Many people in academia have. Here is a philosopher writing about this issue. The climate change skeptic seems to be just obviously and demonstrably failing to respond correctly to her evidence, and thus to be obviously and demonstrably irrational. Well, I'm going to be arguing tonight that that's plainly not true. In fact, it's good to be skeptical, not in the extreme sense of thinking we could never have an ev any evidence for or against the thesis of climate change, but instead to say that at this point, it's premature to really come to any very firm conclusions. People seem to approach this with a great deal of hubris, but I think that's shocking when you look at the complexity of the problem and the ways in which people actually try to deal with it. My own attitude is closer to that of Jewish Curry, professor of Earth and Atmospheric Sciences at Georgia Tech, who says this, there's widespread agreement on three basic tenets, that surface temperatures have increased since 1880, that humans are adding carbon dioxide to the atmosphere, and carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases have a warming effect on the planet. But there's disagreement about the most consequential issues, whether the warming since 1950 has been dominated by human causes, how much the planet will warm in the 21st century, whether warming is dangerous, whether we can afford to radically reduce CO2 emissions, and whether reduction will improve the climate. Interviewed later, just in the last few weeks, she said, I'm not sure we know anything much more than the, the sign of the change from more CO2 in the atmosphere, which is more warming. It's a very complex problem. We don't have the answers yet. If we reflect on the structure of the claims that are behind a certain position anyway in the climate change debate, it comes down to this. First, the Earth is undergoing significant warming. Secondly, the cause of warming is to a significant extent human activity. That is to say, it's anthropogenic. Specifically, carbon emissions are driving this. Warming is having and will increasingly have significant negative effects. And finally, changes in human activity can, to a significant degree, mitigate those negative effects. Well, I want to talk about each of those in turn. But before we get to the main point, I want to discuss problems in modeling. Because if you stop and think about the complexity of the problem here, it's really quite remarkable. Imagine trying to figure out the average 
temperature right now in Austin, Texas. That would include in the middle of the football stadium. It would include in the middle of the highway. It would include people's backyards. It would include the Colorado River. It would include a vast amount. And after all, you'd be dealing with this not only at street level, maybe, but at the tops of buildings and so on. How would you compute that? Now, of course, we have weather stations around town and we could average them out. But how representative are those stations? They tend to be in places where people have lots of interest. There's a huge amount that's going unsampled. And so once you think about the complexity of that problem, and then you think about trying to determine the average temperature for a year in Austin, and then think about extrapolating that to the entire Earth, you realize you're talking about collecting vast amounts of data and trying to understand that. So it's something that presents a huge statistical problem and just a huge practical problem of trying to collect all of that data. Now, what kinds of problems do you encounter? Well, not only is there the vast scale of the problem, there is the complexity of the climate system, really a bunch of interconnected systems. You've got all sorts of systems interacting in the atmosphere, in the oceans, at various levels of the atmosphere, different things are happening. You've got cosmic radiation, solar radiation, all sorts of things, including the Earth's magnetic field, that have an effect on weather and climate. And so a lot of these mechanisms, a lot of these systems have feedback loops built into them, and they interact with one another. It's very hard to model those sorts of feedback mechanisms. And so add the scale of the problem to the immense mathematical complexity of the problem, and you start getting a sense of how difficult this has to be. There are additional problems. What kinds of natural and human forcings, as they put it in the literature, are involved here? That is to say, what kinds of human activities actually have an effect on the climate? What kinds of natural processes and systems have an effect on the climate? It's a vast number in both cases. Which ones are really significant enough to worry about? Well, that's hard to say in the abstract, given that the entire system is chaotic and because of the feedback loops and interdependencies, a small change here can have a huge change over there. So it's very difficult to even enumerate all of the possible influences on climate, let alone come up with adequate theories of all of those and combine them in one large model. In addition to that, we've got a problem of oscillations. Anybody who's looked at a graph of temperatures and it doesn't matter here whether you're dealing with this in hourly or daily or yearly data or even century-long data, it's very jagged. And there are certain secular patterns to it. So when you look at those kinds of problems, you think, wait, we've got to somehow explain these cycles and these oscillations. That's something that is also very difficult to do. It doesn't come naturally out of the equations, which tend to be linear. And so, there is a huge problem about this, including a problem of the quality of data. Many of the weather stations around the world are not really very well tended. How adequate are they in terms of reporting temperatures accurately? And in particular, we have a problem of the heat island effect. A lot of things that were installed, let's say in the 1880s, in the middle of a field, are now in the middle of a city or the middle of a college campus. So how much warming is coming from that heat island effect? The IPCC and other agencies assure us, oh, it's an insignificant problem. But other studies have found that it's actually a very substantial problem, that as much as 20% or even more of the reported warming actually comes from the urban heat island effect. So that too is something that has to be studied carefully and it has to be studied station by station. Since there are thousands of stations, that's a very difficult task. There's also a problem of missing data, and it has two different dimensions. One dimension is that in some cases, weather stations simply stop reporting, and there are gaps of hours, days, even weeks, where there simply is no data from that station. But there's a more fundamental problem. Over a significant part of the Earth's surface, there are no weather stations at all. Antarctica is a good example, but also the middle of Africa, various places in Asia, northern Canada. All of those have 
essentially no stations, or at least there are large regions where there are no stations at all. And so if you take a look at this map, you can see that significant areas are simply gray. Oh. Look at the gray areas here on that world map. They are areas where there is no data. Near the poles, not surprising. In the reaches of the Amazon, around the Hudson Bay, in various places in the Sahara and in the deep African jungle, and so on. Now, how much difference does that make and how do we deal with that when we're dealing with a global climate model? Well, the answer is people typically extrapolate, interpolate data for those missing regions from surrounding regions. And they do that quite reasonably. That often has to be done with large databases and statistics, but it ends up having a huge effect on the result. If we look at the next chart, you'll see what happens once that data is extrapolated and those holes are filled in. Now, one, we get the surrounding regions suddenly being swept across that missing region, and that may or may not be adequate to what's actually going on. You might think, for example, that the deep jungle or that the Sahara Desert have rather different climatic properties than the areas that surround them. So that's problem number one. But secondly, it turns out to have a significant effect in the models on all sorts of regions for which we do have data. So if you compare those two, you start seeing all sorts of areas, Eastern Australia, Eastern Canada, the Western United States, the entire nation of Spain, that suddenly changed dramatically, even though we have data. Extrapolate the data to the missing regions, and suddenly it changes the way the model treats lots of the known regions, which is a rather bizarre side effect. How significant is that? Well, it turns out to be quite significant. A substantial amount of warming, perhaps as much as 30% of reported warming, is actually due to those extrapolations. Now, if we think about other kinds of problems, we realize that there are some differences um, between the reported and predicted results and the data that is actually observed. Those become substantial issues as well. In fact, there are several kinds of disagreement that you might worry about. One is just in the sources of the data. There are different satellite data sets, for example. They don't actually agree. There are surface data sets. There are oceanic measurements. There are various ways of trying to measure through balloons and other technologies, temperatures in the atmosphere at various levels. You can do various things to try to drill down and take, for example, core samples that are going to reveal something about temperature records in the Arctic or Antarctic ice, for example. Those don't necessarily give you the same picture. In addition to that, there are many, many different climate models, and they give radically different predictions for the future. Here you see a chart of 73 models and their predictions for the next century. And you can then look at, um, actually, it's not even the next century, <laughs> but then look at the actual observations. This is actually just 1979 to 2020. You can see that the 73 models differed hugely from one another, but also they differed radically from the data. The most conservative model in the sense the one that predicted the least warming is the one that most closely fits the data. So that too is a significant reason for worry. Not only is there not much agreement about which data set is appropriate and which model is most accurate, but as far as we can see so far, none of the models have turned out to be very accurate at all. There are some other problems. Since 1998, there has been a much discussed hiatus or pause in warming. There was a sudden resumption of warming, it seemed, in 2016, and again to a smaller degree in 2020. But for about an 18-year span, there was really no significant warming at all. And none of the models predicted that. Notice all of those showed lines, not the kind of thing we've actually observed in the data. So now if we move on, there is the uh, 1997 to June 2015 graph. You can see the sharp spike in 2018. But then after that, you get what looks like just random noise. 
there is no observable pattern at all. And in fact, if you consider the regression on the remaining part, it's almost exactly random. You just get zero. And the same thing happens if you look at what's happened since 2016. If we look at the next graph, you see a similar kind of pattern, a sharp spike in 2016, and then what looks more or less like a random walk. In addition to those problems, we've got various kinds of problems about scientific method, various kinds of issues that have made people worry that in addition to the complexity of the problem and the difficulty of modeling this with inadequate data, given that large areas of the globe are missing and so on, we have additional problems. Now, what kinds of problems? Well, you can see here, we've got a problem of confidence intervals at least in the Intergovernmental Panel for Climate Change reports and a variety of other such reports, you see things listed as very high confidence or low confidence, medium confidence, and so on. There's a lot of debate within the scientific community about what those mean or if they have any meaning at all. In fact, here's how it goes. The low confidence one, by the way, that means an extremely low statistical significance. And here's what it amounts to. The weatherman says 10% chance of rain tomorrow. And so you report, it will rain tomorrow, low confidence. <laughs> well, that's not entirely inaccurate, and they do explain what they're doing, but it can be quite misleading. And it can make you think, why are you bothering to assert this at all if you have low confidence in its truth? But in addition to that's really a rhetorical problem. There are more scientific problems. These reports tend to rely a lot on unpublished sources, on sources that are not peer reviewed. They are subject to a lot of political interference. And I'll circle back to that one in a moment because there are some outrageous examples of that. They tend to rely on a lot of secret data and people are very unresponsive when asked for their data sets so that people can check the math in effect or apply a different model and a different set of assumptions to the same data. There is a politicized selection of the contributors to these group projects, which are what all of the IPC reports and other things are. In addition to that, you've got a lack of independent review. Basically, the politicians who pick the contributors pick the reviewers. And so it's no surprise that the reviewers generally don't have much criticism. In addition to that, you've got general problems of confirmation bias that affect all of us. But, in a, but there is a problem that is, in a way, more profound. A lot of this research is driven by government grants. The government spends a vast amount of money. In fact, across the world, over the past 20 years, governments have spent something like $64 billion supporting climate change-related research. It is almost all dedicated to finding human causes of climate change and to finding that climate change is a significant problem. Critics are sometimes accused of accepting money from the oil and gas industry. But actually, for every dollar that the oil and gas industry spends on this kind of research, more than $1,000 is spent by governments on the other side. So there's tremendous pressure just from financial considerations to take a certain kind of, uh, of, of stance on this general issue. You're much more likely to get funding if you claim that climate change is a serious problem. In addition to that, we've got in a lot of the, of the research a kind of neglect of the null hypothesis or a denial that natural processes play a very significant role. But as we'll see when we look at the history, that seems like a puzzling assumption. Sometimes research is claimed to show that, but again, there's a lot of discussion about whether that kind of research is adequate to really understanding the magnitude of natural forcings. And there are a variety of other problems. We've got poorly understood factors, everything from water vapor and oceanic currents, cloud cover, to a variety of things like the El Nino, La Nina effects, um, the Earth's magnetic field, the effect of wind. All of these are relatively poorly understood. And you might think, wait a minute, <laughs> atmospheric pressure is in this group too. So think about what you find out when you watch the weather report you find out things like, ah, not only the temperature, but the relative humidity, the atmospheric pressure, whether there's a low pressure system or a high pressure system coming in. And all of those things are missing. 
you find out wind direction and speed missing from all of these models. That seems like a shocking fact. And recently, people have been trying to do a better job of modeling and insert them into some of the models. But so far, this is still at a very primitive level. There tends to be an assumption, and I call it an assumption that's not entirely fair, but it's mostly an assumption that the effects of further warming will be negative. Now, no one doubts that vast warming would be negative. On the other hand, what about an additional degree or two degrees or even five degrees centigrade? How bad would that be for human beings and other living things on the planet? The answer to that isn't really all that clear. Research points to various possible negative effects. But on the other hand, if we look at the warming that's actually taken place since the Little Ice Age, for example, or even since 100 years ago, we find those effects have not been very significant and don't seem very affected by CO2 emissions or other things. So it's not obvious the extent to which there would be negative effects. One negative effect, for example, that's claimed is that crops would not do as well if the earth warmed. Why? Supposedly there would be increased droughts. But wait, increased CO2 in the atmosphere? Plants love CO2. That should be good for plant growth. And warming temperatures might make certain areas now too warm to grow the crops that have been growing there, but it might make other cooler areas now warm enough for agriculture. So the balance, the net effect of all that is really hard to determine. Well, finally, there is a neglect of two things in the model that seem important. First is that virtually all the models assume linearity. That is to say, they basically use linear relationships among the various variables. In cases where you have feedback loops and complicated interactions, that kind of linearity forces a certain mathematical conception of what's happening that is almost certainly inadequate to the underlying phenomena. And then in addition to that, we have the difficulty of temporal ordering. In, term, in order to determine a causal relationship, it's not enough to just say that these two factors are correlated. Often it matters which one came first. Which came first, the chicken or the egg? Well, here, what comes first? The temperature increase or the CO2 increase in the atmosphere? There's some evidence that it's actually the warming that takes place first, and that increases in CO2 levels result from the warming and not the other way around. In any case, those kinds of temporal concerns are usually missing from the models altogether. So there are many reasons for worrying, both about the adequacy of these official governmental reports about climate change, but also about the methodology that underlies this. Now, I don't mean to say that there's something wrong or fraudulent or anything like that about this research. The point is rather that it's still at a relatively primitive level. It is hard to construct a mathematical model that takes into account all of these feedback loops, all of these interdependencies, the fact that many of these relationships may be nonlinear, that temporal ordering of what's going on may be hugely important. So it's an immensely difficult scientific problem. Let's turn now to a different sort of issue. <laughs> and well, before I get to the different issue, I forgot about this slide, but it's important. I promised to circle back. And unlike the current press secretary, I'm actually going to do it, okay? There has been, in some cases, real political interference. And what do I mean? Here is a great example. The original draft of the first IPCC report in 1995 said this, and this, by the way, was unanimously approved. This specific language was unanimously approved by the scientific people who are authoring that report. No study to date has both detected a significant climate change and positively attributed all or part of that change to anthropogenic causes. Here is the way it emerged published the next year. The balance of evidence suggests a discernible human influence on global climate. In other words, the scientists said there is no evidence that P, and what was published was not P. <laughs> Now that's a pretty striking example of the politicians going in and changing what the scientists actually said. Now, I can't think of another example that is quite that blatant. And since then, the scientists have gotten the memo and basically start telling people what they want to hear, but only to some degree. Many of the scientists who have worked on these panel reports 
with the IPCC and in various other places, have become disillusioned and have said it was the most discouraging scientific episode I had in my life, simply because the scientists engaged in a certain kind of discussion and then the report didn't really reflect either the complexity or even sometimes the general direction of the scientific discussion. Well, let's turn directly to the issue of global warming. Warming of the climate system is unequivocal, said the IPCC in 2014. And since the 1950s, many of the observed changes are unprecedented over decades to millennia. The period from 1983 to 2012 was likely the warmest 30 year period of the last 1400 years in the Northern Hemisphere where such assessment is possible. Medium confidence. <laughs> Okay, which really means uh, about 50-50. Well, in any case, that has become now an article of faith. These have been the warmest years on record, say many different sources. Earth's global average surface temperature in 2020 tied with 2016 is the warmest year on record, said NASA. And what you see if you begin to look through the literature is scary graph after scary graph. You see things like this, for example, globally average combined land and ocean surface temperature anomaly. And look at that. You see some warming over the 19th century and early part of the 20th century. And then after 1950, you see dramatic warming. So that is something that is rather startling. Now, observation, people report anomalies, global air temperature anomaly. What does that mean? It means that we're seeing things relative to a baseline. So these are changes. This, this graph goes from negative 0.6 to positive one degree centigrade, okay? But that's just the change. Take a baseline and then look at things that are below and things that are above that baseline. If you actually saw this as a graph of temperature, it would look less alarming. But in any case, you see lots of graphs like this, and they do seem to point to very significant global warming. But how significant? Well, if we look at other sources, you find graphs for ocean, ocean temperatures, for example, for sea level rising, for a variety of things happening at different levels of the atmosphere. And all of those graphs seem to confirm that yes, global warming is happening. You observe it in the atmosphere at various levels. You observe it in the oceans. It's a serious problem. But just how serious is it? This is a reconstruction of global temperatures going back for thousands of years. If you take a look at the right side of the graph here and the black line, which indicates temperatures, you see, well, a sudden recent spike. And the trough before that is the Little Ice Age, setting around 1700 to 1750. Before that, you see the medieval warm period. And according to this graph, we're now at about the same level that we were at throughout much of the later medieval period. Before that, a bit of a dip for what we think of as the Dark Ages, but before that, the Roman Warm Period. And the Roman Warm Period was actually significantly warmer, as far as we can tell, than the medieval Warm Period, and that it is today. And then we go back a bit further, and we get to the Holocene Climate Optimum, a time when life on Earth seemed to thrive and when it was quite a bit warmer than it is today. Now, the bottom part of that graph, the red line, indicates solar cycles. And the general divisions in the graph are about 2,450 year cycles of solar activity. If you look at those cycles, you start seeing that there is some kind of relationship here. So it's rather remarkable, given that only in the last 70 years, let's say, has there been significant industrial pollution in the form of CO2 or other carbon emissions into the atmosphere. It looks as if, wait, the natural world has been doing a lot that is not really taken account of in these models. And it's also rather remarkable because you look back and you say, well, these temperatures may be the warmest on record, but keep in mind that the record doesn't actually go back very far. It only goes back to the 1880s, roughly. And beyond that, we're reconstructing in various ways, but it's pretty hard to tell what the temperature in Rome was, let's say, in the year 600 or in the year one, or in 400 BC. So let's take a look then at 
what we might see if we looked at a locality. This is probably such small print it's hard for you to read. But I went to my hometown of Pittsburgh and just said, when were there the warmest seasons on record? And it doesn't actually matter whether you take the warmest days or the warmest months or the warmest seasons, you'll get something similar. And it's not just my own hometown of Pittsburgh. I've, I've done this with a variety of different cities and it works with all of them. You look at the record warm winters, the record warm springs, summers, falls, and yes, you see a few recent things here, 2012, 2016, you find a few others within the last few decades. But the great predominance of those dates are in the 1880s, the 1890s, the 1930s, the 1940s. And so you look at the graphs that seem to indicate sharp increases in temperatures over the last few decades, but then you think, well, when are the warmest times on record, even for an entire season? And you find, well, a few of them recently, but not actually that many. In fact, you get the impression that the 1880s, the 1930s, 1940s, were basically about the same temperatures as it is today, maybe a little warmer. Now, as I've said, this is something you find when you look at measurements like this and reports like this all over the globe. It's not just in Pittsburgh, but there's an outlier. And so that makes you think, well, wait a minute, what, what's going on here in the data? Now, people began to ask that question and began to be disturbed by what they found. Here is a graph of heat wave indices. It's trying to track when there are periods of four or more days with high temperatures. And as you can see, there's been a slight increase over the past few decades. But on the other hand, there was a huge spike in the 1930s, the Dust Bowl era. And otherwise, it looks like we're back to where we were in the 1880s and 1890s. So that too confirms that throughout the United States as a whole, this current climate situation is not unprecedented or not even that remarkable. This can make you ask some questions about what on earth is going on with the historical record. If things look like that, when you look at these raw temperature readings for the United States or for particular locations, then what are those other graphs representing? And it can incline us to ask the following question. How much of apparent global warming is due to adjustments made to these raw historical measurements? People first began to ask this question, not actually just on the basis of these kinds of things, but on the basis of comparing the graphs that they found in various governmental reports to earlier governmental reports. And they found not just that the future projections keep changing or that the missing years are filled in, you'd expect that, but that the past kept changing. And they suddenly said, well, wait, what's going on here? Why is the past changing? And actually changing very significantly. Here you see the gap between the raw temperature measurements, which are there in blue, the top graph, and then the adjusted ones in red. And what are these adjustments that people have been making? Without, by the way, any admission or discussion of this, without any justification, they've been making these adjustments to the data. Supposedly, when challenged, they say, well, it's, it's just a question of equipment being replaced and trying to calibrate equipment. But look at the difference. The past has been systematically and dramatically lowered and Recent temperatures have been adjusted upward. That seems surprising. And it can make us ask, well, just how much of the reported data is due to that? Just look at the graphs and you can get the sense that a lot of it is. And indeed, if we look at the adjustments, and here's a graph just of the adjustments, just of those changes between those two, you find, yes, everything before about 1950 has been dramatically adjusted downward. And then almost everything since 1950 has been dramatically adjusted upward. That's a coincidence since 1950 was really the beginning of our industrial age and large carbon emissions from human sources into the atmosphere. So if we look at that, it turns out, analyzing it statistically, two remarkable things are true. First of all, it turns out 100% of global warming reported in the data is actually due to the adjustments. 
not due to the raw temperature data itself. And the second thing is that the adjustments correlate remarkably with the graph of CO2 emissions. The correlation, the R squared, is 0.82 between CO2 emissions and the adjustments that people have made. That seems like a shocking coincidence. It's enough of a coincidence that all the ones before 1950 go down, almost all the ones after 1950 go up. But then the correlation, tracking carbon emissions almost exactly, that's a remarkable fact. Now, what about human activity? After all, part of the claim here is not simply that there's significant global warming, but that it's due to human activity. How strong is the data that it really is due to human activity? We see in various reports, like the IPCC report, graphs like this. There, the orange is meant to indicate what we get out of the models with natural and with human sources. The blue, what we get simply with natural sources. And the idea is supposed to be that if we just take into account the natural and not the human sources, we get a bad prediction. We don't show any warming at all. And so this inadequacy is not only there globally, we look at various regions of the globe and we find the same thing. We find that the at least adjusted temperatures seem to track what happens when we include human activity. Exclude the human activity and you seem to lose predictive power altogether. But that is a little surprising given that here is something that is on, more on a geologic time scale than even the thousand year time scale and tens of thousands of years time scale I showed you earlier. This is one where we see over a long period of time radical changes in climate, glacial periods, interglacial periods, and so on. Tremendous changes that are due to natural factors. After all, unless we think that the cavemen were engaged in serious agriculture and industry, we don't have any human activity that could really explain any of those changes. So there has been significant natural change in the past. It seems remarkable to think that it really is contributing nothing now. There is additional reason for worrying. Here is a graph of temperatures put together with a graph of sunspot numbers. Look at the degree of correlation there. It seems significant. And so it would be surprising if we built sunspots into our model and found that it simply had no impact at all. It looks as if actually that has a significant impact on climate. At least there's a significant correlation. So that too gives us reason for worrying about the extent of and significance of human activity. This is a graph that I should have shown you earlier, actually, I now realize, of CO2 emissions coming from human sources. You see here a significant amount, all really accelerating rapidly around 1950, which is why I keep using that date. CO2 has become a much more significant issue since then. Amounts have been rising radically just due to increased industrialization here and throughout the world. And here we see tracking of various human sources and their significance. We see um, a variety of different things, transportation, buildings, industry, electricity, agriculture, forestry, other land uses, and then various other non-CO2 uh, pollutants in the environment. But actually, if you look at other natural sources, you find out that they outweigh even these human sources. All human and animal sources add up to a fraction of what is contributed simply by decomposition of leaves, for example, on the forest floor, of plants. And so in addition to the emissions issues, you've got uptake. Plants and other things in the natural environment are absorbing CO2. And there's a huge amount of variation. So actually, when you look at the amount of variability that exists in those natural sources, you realize that human activity is actually swallowed up by the variations. That's not to say it has no significance at all. It's not some tiny, tiny fraction. But on the other hand, the variation in human sources seems minor compared to the variation in various natural sources. Moreover, we're already making significant reductions in human contributions to carbon emissions. This is a graph of annual US CO2 emissions 
from 1983 to the present. And as you can see, we peaked around 15 years ago, and it's been declining ever since, largely through natural gas replacing coal and oil, but also to some extent through renewables and other sources. And in fact, the United States has done better than any other country. Here you can see decreases above the line, the middle, and then increases in carbon emissions on the part of other countries afterward. China is there at the bottom of the graph, and you can see that the Chinese additions um, in carbon emissions really outweigh everybody else put together. What about the negative effects that are often claimed? Well, I've been going on long enough, so I'm not going to talk much about this. I'll just say that often people ascribe increases in extreme weather events, hurricanes, tornadoes, wildfires, and so on, to climate change. But first of all, there's rather little evidence of any connection. And secondly, there's actually little evidence of increased activity. This is a graph of global tropical cyclone frequency, hurricanes on the top and tropical storms on the bottom. And as you can see, it looks like a random walk. There is no significant increase over time. And the same thing is true if we think about to, um, the total hurricane energy, that is to say what all of them add up to altogether, well, again, you look at this and it doesn't look as if there's any particular increasing pattern. Let me just point out the different lines here. Watch carefully in this and in other statistical type analysis what the time period is. I can take that graph of global energy and make it look like there's a radical increase or a decline depending upon the years in which I start my sample and end it. So those lines are meant to indicate I can tell any story I want based on that data. But now let's go and look at tornadoes. Here's a graph of tornado activity. Again, no obvious pattern, no general increase. If we say, but what about the really serious tornadoes? Actually, they seem to be decreasing in severity. How about wildfires? This is a graph of total global burned area. And as you can see, it's been declining in general. So there doesn't really seem to be any increase in extreme weather events. There's just increased reporting and information about extreme weather events. 30 years ago, you probably wouldn't have heard about wildfires in Australia. Now you do. But that doesn't mean the fire problem is more serious. It just means we know more about it. Finally, we can look at the global death risk. What about all of this? Look, isn't it a serious threat to human life? And isn't all that increasing? No, it's actually been decreasing, in fact, quite radically. Over the last century, you're much less likely to actually suffer harm from a tornado, a hurricane, a wildfire, or any other natural source of extreme event like this. Let's turn at last to that fourth part, the mitigation part. Can we do anything about this? This is a complex topic, one that in the reports issued by these agencies is often really treated very cursorily. But there are all sorts of things we can do, some hugely expensive, some perhaps not so expensive. I leave you with this last thought. 37% of all the dollars ever printed were printed in 2020. So the margin for financial shenanigans is much smaller than you think. Well, let me just close by saying, moral of the story isn't supposed to be on any particular side of the climate change issue, but simply to say all of this is in its infancy. It's a hugely complex problem. There are serious problems with all of our current techniques for understanding it. We are decades away from being able to say with confidence what's actually happening now and what's likely to happen in the future. Thank you. So thank you very much, Professor Bonovac. I think this was honestly the best lecture I've attended on the issue. Um, I think you showed us uh, why we can reasonably disagree without killing each other, but just, you know, knowing that the science is not very clear. Um, so thank you for that, because that's for us the point where we want to start it from so that there can be a conversation about these issues and we can have different views and different opinions. Now, I have my computer next to me to be sure that I can take some questions from our audience. But since I promised 
at the start that I would have said where this interest of you, you know, of yours like comes from. So like you are a philosopher, you work on metaphysics. Um, just, you know, if you can tell us uh, why this climate change. Ah, right. Um, I got interested in these topics actually because of a debate topic. I was on a debate team in high school and one of our debate topics concerned uh, environmental regulation and pollution controls. So I got interested in the topic then. Um, our high school had a little group called the Society for Human Survival and, and hey, we were highly effective. Humans have survived. <laughs> um, but when I went to college, I took some courses in physics on uh, climate change type issues to the extent that that you know, existed in the early 1970s and got very interested in the topic then, but also became convinced that the uh, level of scientific understanding of this was still primitive. And I don't mean here that scientists don't understand a lot of the complexities of the problem. The way I've sometimes put it is this. I think people do have some idea of what physical processes are involved. It's a vast number of them, and it's hard to know how many of them really need to be taken into account. But we do have theories of some of these processes. Um, what we don't have is any idea of what the uh, coefficients in the equations really ought to be. We don't know how these interact. We don't know what the levels of various things are. And we don't have adequate data to really give very clear evidence in one direction or another about this. Now, over the time since the 1970s, people have obviously gotten greater data. People have developed all sorts of new techniques for gathering data and for modeling. So the state of the science has improved significantly from the days in which we were worried about global cooling in the 1970s. But it's not as if today we really have when you think about the large geologic timescales involved in thinking about the Earth's climate, our data is still pretty limited and things get very conjectural once we go back before 1880, uh, for most of the globe at any rate. There was a small group that has been keeping temperature records very carefully in central England since about 1650. <laughs> but in most parts of the globe, we really have nothing very reliable until satellite data started coming in in 1979. Now, 1979 also happened to be a very cold year and the end of several cold decades. Mm. And so when you start the data sets in 1979, you do see what looks like warming in many cases. But that's partly because the 60s and 70s were unusually cool and the 80s and 90s were unusually warm. So how much one can infer from that in a larger sense, I'm not sure. And it very much worries me when scientists look at a period like that and then draw these straight lines into the future. Um, I think, I don't want to belittle the state of the science. I think there are a lot of incredibly talented people doing very good work, but it's just a problem that seems to dwarf those efforts. And uh, I think it probably will be another century before we have enough data to really come up with the kinds of epistemic confidence you see in the statements of politicians. Until then, I think, and lots of scientists actually do think, <laughs> that this is an important topic that deserves a lot more study. There are intriguing things, but about which scientists can and do disagree. Mm -hmm. And uh, in addition to that, a lot of dimensions of the problem that everyone agrees are important. Cloud cover, for example, wind. <laughs> Everybody knows those are important, but nobody really has a very comprehensive or adequate theory of them. And so that's... Uh, so you, you basically, if I may um, uh, jump, you, you basically went to philosophy because there is a lot more certainty in yeah. philosophy <laughs> than That's there right. is. Uh, well, at least we philosophers admit we know nothing. Okay, yeah, um, and, and maybe this goes to, a, there is a, some, you know, a question that was maybe, um, yeah, uh, you know, wondering how you can speak about this issue since you're a philosopher and not a scientist. So. Um, right. Well, I have remained interested in the topic ever since then and have tried to follow the scientific literature. Um, I published a paper on sustainability a few years ago. And so, uh, and I thought I was going to teach courses in environmental ethics. I've occasionally uh, guest lectured in them. But we now have philosophers of science in our department who do that better than I can do it. And uh, 
in addition to that, I, yes, I mean, I, philosophy of science has always been a major interest of mine. So I've tried to keep my hand in in an area of science where I know enough science to, I hope, make intelligent philosophical comments about what's going on. Uh, on the intelligent comments, I would say yes, for sure. Uh, and I think that's also the opinion of our audience today. But one question from the online audience uh, for you. So, hello, Dr. Bonavac. I greatly appreciate your lecture. Thank you for your time. I noticed that you mentioned CO2 primarily as a greenhouse gas of greatest concern. Have you considered methane as an equally concerning gas, especially since it is 10 times as effective as, effective as a greenhouse gas and is currently trapped in large amounts in the currently melting permafrost in areas like Siberia and Greenland? That would lend itself to a positive feedback loop that would I, heat the atmosphere in a major way. Oh, yeah, great question. Um, when people talk about carbon emissions, often they focus on CO2 alone. But it's an excellent point that methane is also a significant contributor. And in fact, by some measures, a much more significant contributor. Um, there is much less research on it, which is somewhat puzzling. And in things like the IPCC report or the 2017 um, report, it, there's just much less attention paid to it. Um, I can't give a full explanation for why that's true. Um, probably it's true partly because human activity is much harder to pin down as a source of it. Um, but, but yes, I, I think that's something that does deserve much greater study. And other greenhouse gases do as well. Um, I think there has been a focus on CO2 because people know to a greater extent how to measure it and how to affect the levels of it in the atmosphere. Um, other greenhouse gases have gotten much less attention, perhaps wrongly. Um, on the polar ice caps, it is certainly true that the polar ice cap, um, or at least the North Pole area, has experienced significant warming and significant glacial melting. Um, that has not been true in Antarctica for reasons that are still somewhat controversial and unclear. Um, and so it's... Uh, what what the questioner is saying is quite plausible. I think um, there is a fair amount of agreement with that statement. Um, but the mechanisms by which this is happening are still, I think, not terribly well understood. Okay. And, okay. and uh, the person who asked questions question is also uh, thanking you. Uh, we have another question from Mary Sid. Uh, great lecture, Professor Bonavac. Since we are clear on the lack of clarity around the climate change controversy, how do we move forward? Who do we trust? What legislation is worth taking seriously and what needs to be questioned? Oh, good. Uh, <laughs> yeah, one thing you can do is, uh, and actually it is a useful section at the end of the last IPCC report talking about mitigation. There's a discussion of many, many <laughs> mitigation strategies. And you can look through those. Some of them are are highly intuitive and probably not immensely expensive, like um, doing research into and implementing what we now know about uh, roofing materials to try to improve the performance and to reduce um, the CO2 emissions from buildings, as well as dealing with reflectance properties and so on. Um, that's something that seems like a, a rational sort of thing to do. Um, other things are much more radical, and some seem to have very indirect connections to climate change at all. So the first thing I would say is um, look carefully at the different strategies and ask A, how much will it cost? <laughs> B, how much good will it do? And here I think there is a real question about how much good any human changes in activity are really likely to do because I worry that we're just not that important a factor. Um, but the final thing I wanted to say about this is that it's very important to go to primary sources. Um, important not to pay attention to the article in the New York Times or even the ones in various science publications, sadly, but to actually look at some of the articles that appear in academic journals. Scientists, when they talk to one another, do not make these blanket pronouncements. <laughs> um, they're very carefully nuanced and they report problems in data. They report issues for further study and so forth. So you get a very different picture when you actually read the scientific literature. Now, most people will say, but I can't read these scientific journals. 
Well, you can read the abstracts, you can read the introduction, you can read the conclusion. And even if you can't follow the argument in between and don't know what a lot of these symbols mean or a lot of these acronyms mean, um, you can nevertheless see what the conclusion of these things is and also just get a sense of the overall drift of the research. So I think that's an important thing to do. Um, the scientists themselves who participate in these reports, as I mentioned, are often frustrated by the, the sort of blanket lack of nuance in these reports. And it's even worse if you just look at the political summary, but even the scientific parts, there's a lot of nuance that's being missed, but it's there in the academic papers. Mm -hmm. So try to be more aware of that. Now, I realize not everybody has access to those, but if you've got a university account and can actually look at these or click on that link in the article you're reading, click on that link, see mm -hmm. where it goes and, mm -hmm. and read the original source. Follow the science. <laughs> Follow the science, exactly. Yeah. Um, so we have another question from our online audience. Uh, again, thanking you for the lecture. In your preparation for this lecture, uh, did you come across a model that you preferred for forecasting global average temperatures? If so, what did you like about it and why? <laughs> I don't have a favorite. And um, partly that's because the inner workings of these models are often relatively opaque. <laughs> that is to say, you can find in published papers um, what the model will tell you under this scenario or that scenario. And often they're very good at determining what's going to happen if you alter this variable or that type of thing. Um, using them for prediction, it's actually what not, it's not what many of the models were really designed to do. And so, that is the first problem and first reason I don't really have a favorite. I think they're often being used for purposes they're not really designed for. But the other thing is that the inner workings are too hard to tell from the outside and people understandably don't take you through this because they're immensely complex. But that means you can look at projections and take a guess about which one you think mm -hmm. might be the most plausible or which ones had the best record in the past. But the fact is that until you really get into the details inside the models and see what they're doing. It's very hard to know. And if I can connect that to the point about adjustments, I didn't mean to say, so it's all mm -hmm. bogus, it's all an artifact. Um, what I meant to say is, it turns out the entire question of warming over the last century really comes down to, are those adjustments scientifically defensible or not? Mm -hmm. And since there is really no published discussion of that question, I have no idea. <laughs> and I don't think anybody can rationally at this point say, oh, they are or they're not, and here's precisely why. I'm not aware, at least, of any published peer-reviewed analysis of the adjustments that gives us anything to work with. Thank you. So I think that answers that question. And then we, are, we have one a question. Sorry if I look at, at the computer while I'm trying to read. Uh, we have a question from our senior fellow and your colleague, Professor Robert Coons. Uh, complimenting you and congratulating you on the lecture, and how would you respond to the precautionary principle argument? Ah, I'm glad you asked, Rob. <laughs> uh, yes, many people will say, look, I, yeah, maybe we don't know for sure. Maybe there's a lot of scientific disagreement on clarity once you look below the surface. But look, the fate of the Earth is at stake here, the fate of humanity. The downside is so extreme, we shouldn't take any risks that could lead to the extinction of our entire species or maybe even the extinction of life on the planet. And some people that I respect tremendously, like Nassim Nicholas Taleb, have said, yes, exactly, the risk is so large, the downside is so great, that we really need to be extremely careful um, and take every precaution we can take. And if the models are unclear, that even makes it more serious because we really can't even make a rational assessment of the risk. Um, I worry about this sort of thing on several grounds, philosophically. Um, one of them is just that I think if we extrapolated this to ordinary life, life would be 2020 forever, yeah. okay? <laughs> um, we, would, we would think, should I go to the university and you know, yeah. go to the library, do some research? Oh my, I could be killed in a car. Even yes. if I'm not killed, I could be maimed in a car accident. And 
And that, gosh, that's, that's pretty terrible for me, right? That's kind of personal extinction at stake. And what's the game here? I don't know. And, you know, maybe it's something significant, maybe not. Uh, I'm not really sure. I don't know what the probability is of my being killed, you know. And, the, and so I better not do it. And that kind of thing, first of all, if, if it's extrapolated along a large scale, just means human beings shouldn't do much of anything except huddle um, <laughs> in, a, in a fetal position. But there are serious philosophical defenses of it, so I don't mean to dismiss it out of hand. It does seem to me, though, that we need to make an assessment of not only what we know about how significant the risk is, and how costly it would be to avoid that risk. Presumably, none of these people want to say, because there's a, a possibility you will die someday in an airplane crash, you could be, should be willing to spend almost everything you have to buy insurance against that. And so I think there's something, there's a careful assessment that has to be made here. And I don't buy the argument that uncertainty about risks or about ultimate costs means we should be even more careful. Um, if somebody says, look, uh, be careful about going into that room. There could be a wild animal in there. I have no data. I've never been in the room before. Could be. <laughs> um, I have no way of assessing the probability. It sounds like a pretty serious risk if there is one. But on the other hand, how strong is my reason for, you know, if somebody says a tiger's escaped from the zoo and it was seen heading into this, in this direction, okay, I'm going to be pretty cautious. But I need to be sure about these reports. And if it's my kindergartner telling me, oh, there's a tiger in the room, you know, I, I'm likely to say, yeah, yeah, yeah. And so I think here we have to look at the science and try to come up with some rational assessment of how serious the problem appears to be. Yeah. And that's why the kinds of questions I've been talking about tonight seem to me really central. So I don't think you can use the precautionary principle to the extent that it's legitimate and just wave this away and say, uh, we, d we don't have to know <laughs> with any security and we don't have to be able to assess the risks. Um, we should just do everything we can to prevent the risk given what we do know. Thank you. Also because if the 50 is 50% 50 a tiger, 50% your next best friend, um, yeah, what, what is the best, the best option? So if the, com the level of confidence 50% is you pre presented, sometimes it, even lower than that, um, that the cautionary principle could be halting our lives. I have a question related to, um, there was a proposal on, on an article I recently read on National Review that was suggesting that we could agree on a policy that had to do with zoning. So the, the argument in the article was most seven, probably 75% of the United States are, is um, land where only houses can be, and like private houses, and that means that then for everything else, one needs to take the car and drive somewhere else. So coming from Europe, where houses and uh, banks and post office and cafeterias are all in the same place and we didn't need a car, assuming that was, you know, the climate change was, you know, is something that really we need to uh, address by diminishing um, the emissions. What do you think of this agreement on a policy that would also make the city look more like a community? Ah, yes. This has been uh, one of the mitigation strategies that you find, and it's often pushed by urban planners and others for reasons that are only remotely connected to climate change. Um, one worry I have is that Americans aren't used to living that way. Um, and when they're given the choice, they tend to, especially when they have children, move out of cities and move to suburbs. They want more space. And so I think it would be hard to convince Americans to move to that model, um, except by pretty coercive measures or measures that financially became, in effect, coercive. But the other thing that worries me about it is that land use in general matters to a degree that isn't adequately taken into account by most of our current models. And those problems in land use uh, and the inadequacy of our understanding of it mean, I think, that we really don't know how much of a gain there would be um, converting a suburb, let's say, into a field or how much danger there is in converting a field into a suburb. Of course, there's the transportation factor. Um, and the fact that if people drive more, then auto emissions go up and so on. And by the way, electric cars seem to me no solution to that problem at all. 
um, it's much less efficient from a purely physics point of view to create the power in a power plant and somehow uh, have transmission to some source that then gets used in some vehicle. Um, much better from the point of view of just physics and en energy usage to burn the gasoline right there where it's being used. But in any case, the point is that um, when you think about the amount of transportation, uh, that is, I, I should say the amount of CO2 emissions, for example, or methane emissions that come from automobiles, and then think about the reduction you can gain from that. It's, it's a relatively small percentage. So um, to the extent that that kind of urbanization happens, it may or may not help on balance. I think we don't know enough about land use to say. Um, is there enough of a gain there to make it worth coercing people into this? I myself doubt it, but um, I think we're not, partly because we don't yet know <laughs> what sources will be used to produce electricity mm -hmm. um, and so on, it's, it's speculative. Yeah, well, thank, thank you very much. You, you helped me understanding more. There was a, the, okay, another question. Okay, somebody is saying that this is a lie. Electric vehicles are much more efficient than any internal combustion vehicle. They're not taking into account energy losses at the power plant and then energy losses in transmission and distribution. Um, so sure, and not to mention the energy required in producing batteries mm -hmm. and eventually then disposing of batteries that have a lot of toxic materials in them. When you look at the entire picture, I don't think that's true. If you look at just the automobile, mm -hmm. yeah, it can look that way. <laughs> okay. But don't look at just the automobile, look at the entire process. Professor Bonavac, thank you very much. I think we could continue probably um, forever. Um, there is also disagreement ongoing, as we can see, between Professor Bonovac and somebody that is um, on, on our chat. But at the same time, I think that what we are showing with this uh, event and with this lecture is that it is reasonable to disagree. We, we, we saw the grounds where it's reasonable to disagree um, and just keep studying and keep uh, looking at the science and what it says. Um, on disagreements, uh, so we want to thank you again, uh, Professor Bonovac, for this very informative, instructive lecture that you gave. Um, I want to say to our audience that if you appreciate, if you've liked this lecture, there are more coming uh, still on the theme of the great divides and the great divisions. There are seminars. Professor Kuhns will be offering a seminar on religion and science and you know do they disagree don't they you know, can they agree um it's just going to be in march we're going to have another lecture in uh, two weeks on the social teachings and the economy you know where is the division there is it um on the right on the left uh what should we think about it so thank you to all our audience the uh, online audience that followed us uh thank you again professor bonavac uh, for more on our next events, just go on our website, austin-institute.org, and there you find all information and you can register. Um, some of these things are in person, of course, always with safety. And um, thank you again for watching. <laughs>